For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and, and pass. Oh, I'm sorry. And pass the rules. S-178, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act of 2019 as amended. Clerk will report the title of the bill. Senate 178, an act to condemn gross human rights violations of ethnic Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang and calling for an end to arbitrary detention, torture, and harassment of these communities inside and outside China. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sears, and the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Smith, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sears. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on S-178. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I yield one minute to our Speaker of the House, the gentle lady from California, Ms. Pelosi. The gentlelady from California is recognized. I thank the gentleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman for, uh, for yielding and for his leadership, and to you and to Mr. Smith, to gentlemen from New Jersey for being champions for human rights. Mr. McCall and Mr. Elliot Engel, also I thank them, the chair and ranking, Mr. Elliot Engel, the chair, and Mr. McCall, the ranking member of the committee, and you, Mr. Speaker, a champion for human rights before, even before you came to Congress. Uh, my colleagues, next week marks 71 years since the nations of the world gathered in Paris to enshrine our global commitment to human rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The opening words of that declaration read, recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind. Today, the human dignity and human rights of the Uyghur community are under threat from Beijing Bar Beijing's barbarous actions, which are an outrage to the collective conscience of the world. Across the Xinjiang uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region, the Uyghur people and other Muslim minorities face brutal repression, a pervasive state of mass surveillance, including the arbitrary and non-consensual collection of children's DNA. The mass incarceration of one to three million innocent people with beating, solitary confinement, de deprivation of food and medical treatment, forced sterilizations and other forms of torture, incidences of mass shootings and extrajudicial killings, and the intimidation and suppression of journalists courageously exposing the truth. Mirgol Toran, a former detainee, testified she faced treatment so brutal I thought I would rather die than go through the torture and beg them to kill me. Another former detainee, uh, Torsene Singwunun, testified, we're all helpless and unable to defend ourselves. We all went through all kinds of mistreatment. The screaming, pleading, crying is still in my head. Today, with this bicameral, overwhelming bipartisan legislation, the United States Congress is taking a critical step to counter Beijing's horrific human rights abuses against Uyghurs. Thank you to Chairman Engel. Uh, thank you to Chairman Brad Ker Sherman, uh, Rep Swazi, and Chairman McGovern for their leadership in this important legislation. We are sending a message to Beijing. America is watching, and we will not stand silent. This legislation helps uncover the truth, requiring reports by the DNI, uh, Director of National Intelligence, the State Department, the FBI, about the depths of the crisis and about China's campaign about journalists exposing the facts. It creates accountability, ensuring transparency of Chinese and foreign companies involved in the camps. And it engages the full firepower of American law and leadership 
including by urging the application of global Magnitsky and other related sanctions and the full implementation of the Frank R. Wolf International Religious Freedom Act, named for our distinguished former colleague and human rights champion, Congressman Frank Wolf. Sadly, Beijing's human rights abuses extend beyond the Uyghurs. From the decades-long abuse faced by the Tibetan people to Hong Kong's fight for democracy and the rule of law and to the jailing of journalists, human rights lawyers, Christians, and democracy advocates on the homeland. In the Congress, Democrats and Republicans stand united with all people fighting for the human rights in the face of China's abuses. And last month, we were proud to pass the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, which has now become law, and we're grateful that the president has signed that legislation. If America does not speak out for human rights in China because of commercial issues, we lose all moral authority to speak out for human rights any place in the world. In honor of the millions fighting for their dignity, safety, and rights in China and around the world, I urge a strong bipartisan vote for the Uyghur Intervention and Global Humanitarian Unified Response Act. And thank Mr. Smith, Mr. Sears, Mr. Sherman, Mr. Swazi, uh, the chair, Mr. Elliot Engel, and Mr. McCall for their leadership, and I acknowledge the leadership of Senator Rubio in the United States Senate on this important legislation. I yield back the balance of my time as I urge an I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Speaker, I reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Smith. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I make it soon. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I want to thank the speaker uh, for her very eloquent remarks and for her tenacity in promoting human rights and respect for the rule of law in all of China, including and especially with today's focus on Xinjiang, uh, where unfortunately Xi Jinping is conducting a massive, massive crimes of, against humanity, against the Muslim Uyghurs. So I want to thank you uh, for that leadership. I want to thank Chairman Engel, uh, Ranking Member McCall, Brad Sherman, and Ranking Member Ted Yohu uh, for their deep and abiding commitment to the suffering people of Xinjiang as well. I'd also like to express my special thanks to the 128 bipartisan co-sponsors of my bill, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act of 2019, uh, H.R. 649, comprehensive human rights legislation that I introduced earlier this year with lead Democratic co-sponsor Tom Swazi to address the massive crimes against humanity committed by the Chinese government against the Uyghurs. The legislation would require the administration to categorize and report on the human rights abuses being committed by the Chinese Communist Party each and every day, take specific steps to sanction Chinese officials for these abuses, especially through the use of the Magnitsky Act, and stop to the greatest extent possible the Chinese government's efforts to create a high-tech police and surveillance state. Despite an endorsement of our bill 12 months ago and co-sponsorship by the Speaker herself, and the Washington Post endorsed it, and they said a full year ago, this has become, that is to say, the situation in Xinjiang, one of the world's most urgent human rights crises. Congress should pass the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. Today, the Senate bill is before us, and I encourage my colleagues and the co-sponsors of H.R. 649 to vote for it. Mr. Speaker, at a congressional hearing that I co-chaired last year, Mirgrel Tunson Tursen recounted her hor horrifying ordeal with torture, sexual abuse, and detention in one of China's mass internment camps in Xinjiang. She broke down weeping, telling us that she pleaded with God to end her life. Her Chinese jailers restrained her to a table, increased the electrical currents coursing through her body, and mocked her belief in God. She was tortured simply for being an ethnic Uyghur and a Muslim in China. There are millions of stories like this waiting to be told about the crimes against humanity being committed each and every day by the Chinese government against the Uyghurs, the Kazakhs, and the Turkic Muslims. Given that this year is the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre, Maybe we should not be surprised by the cruelty and brutality of the Chinese Communist Party. But the size and scale of what is happening in Xinjiang is audaciously repressive 
even by Chinese low standards. The mass internment of millions of people on a scale that has not been seen since the Holocaust. Children ripped from the warm embrace of their families to be indoctrinated in communist ideology and forced to renounce their religious culture and language. Rape, sexual abuse, and forced abortions of women being held in internment camps. Forced labor on a scale that allows Chinese companies to profit from modern day slavery. That atrocities such as these can exist in the 21st century is astounding and enormously sad. We cannot be silent. We must demand an end to these barbaric practices and accountability from the Chinese government. We must say never again to the cultural genocide and the atrocities suffered by the Uyghurs and others in China. Chinese authorities initially denied the existence of mass internment camps, Mr. Speaker, and even now to portray them as vocational training centers. What a cruel joke. They employed lies, censorship, and economic coercion to stifle discussion of their crimes. But documents obtained by the New York Times and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists have exposed the brutality behind Beijing's plans to radically and coercively transform the culture and religion of ethnic Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and other Muslims in China. They, the leaked internal papers show detailed plans to intern between 1 million and 3 million Uyghurs in modern-day concentration camps where they are subjected to severe human rights abuses and Orwellian indoctrination efforts for those, quote, whose thinking has been infected, close quote. At the same time, Beijing instituted plans to erase the influence of Islam in Western China, bulldozing mosques and shrines, severely throttling all religious practice and forcing camp detainees to renounce their faith. The leaked documents also show that Xi Jinping himself has directed the crackdown, saying that the Communist Party must put, quote, the organs of dictatorship, close quote, quote, to work and show his words, absolutely no mercy, close quote, in dealing with the Uyghurs and other Muslims. In one speech exposed by the leaked documents, President Xi Jinping says, and I quote, the weapons of the democratic People's democratic dictatorship must be wielded without any hesitation or wavering. In 2017, he told thousands of police officers and troops standing at attention uh, to prepare for, quote, smashing, a smashing, obliterating offensive. According to the documents, Communist Party officials who were reluctant to carry out Xi's draconian policies were investigated and expunged and worse. Quote, secret teams of investigators traveled across the region, identifying those who were not doing enough. 2017, the party opened more than 12,000 investigations into party members in, Xi, in, in Xinjiang. Xi, Xi Jinping has created, Mr. Speaker, one of the worst human rights tragedies on the face of the earth. Xi Jinping and his government are directly responsible, directly responsible for these crimes against humanity. Our hope is that a reckoning is coming, but only if the international, international community stands up to China. I would note with some sadness, notably absent are voices from many Muslim countries, and I've raised it myself with many leaders of Muslim countries. They have not been as critical of China as they ought to be. They need to speak out and to do it boldly and very clearly. I do want to commend the Trump administration for its actions over the past several years. They have issued strong statements, and according to the U.S. Commerce Department just last month, 28 government agencies and businesses were placed on the entity list and barred. The way the Secretary of Commerce put it, the U.S. government and Department of Commerce cannot and will not tolerate the brutal suppression of ethnic minorities within China, said Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross. This action will ensure our technologies fostered in an environment of individual liberty and free enterprise are not used to repress defenseless minority populations, close quote. These are important steps. This legislation, however, takes the next step. More must be done. Chinese officials, as I said earlier, must need to be held accountable for crimes against humanity, including global Magnitsky and international sanctions and UN investigations. Those who tortured Miragol Tursun 
should know that justice is coming for them as well. And the Chinese government companies profiting from forced labor uh, need to be barred from selling their products made so horribly by forced labor from coming into this country. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sears. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I first would like to ask unanimous consent to submit in the congressional record an exchange of letters between the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee and the chair of the Committee of Judiciary on S-178. Without objection. Let me first thank Mr. Chairman, the Chairman and Mr. Smith of New Jersey for their work on this legislation. I also want to acknowledge the work of the Congressional Executive Commission on China, led by Jim McGovern. His expertise and that of his staff has made significant contribution to the development of this legislation. This bill addresses one of the most egregious violations of human rights in the world today. More than one million U Uyghurs, Uyghurs and other Muslim ethnic minorities have been detained by the Chinese government and sent to camp in Xinjiang, Xinjiang, where they face torture, sexual abuse, brainwashing, and other abuses in an attempt to erase their culture and their religion. The Chinese government is engaging in these atrocities under the guise of anti-terrorism efforts, and the victims have been denied any due process. The severity of this disgrace was recently confirmed by a trope of leaked confidential Chinese documents that detail just how sinister these policies are. Meeting with members of the Uyghur American community is a sobering experience. They have stories about family members in China that can no longer be reached, friends that have gone missing, reports after report of violence, abuse, and mistreatment. The intention of the top Chinese Communist Party leadership through this campaign is clear. In the short term, turn Xinjiang into a prison for ethnic and religious minorities, and in the longer term, force these minorities to assimilate completely, erasing the evidence of their unique culture, history, and religion. The Chinese government has a long record of oppressing Tibetan, Christians, and Falun Gong, and other ethnic religious minorities. But what makes these efforts different is the use of technology to erase the weakest people and their way of life. In some cases, these technologies can be traced back to American companies and research institutions. Unfortunately, we have yet to see an adequate response from the Trump administration, while the administration's decision to announce its visa restrictions and add abuse enabling Chinese tech firm to the entity's list were good steps. They do not go far enough. There needs to be a real consequences for those who have designed and built these internal camps. With the bills we are considering today, the House of Representatives is making clear that there needs to be more serious repercussions. And specifically, this bill calls on the Secretary of State to designate those responsible, responsible for these abuses with global Magnitsky sanctions, including the freezing of the assets. It will also require the American firms do due diligence on where and how the technology is being used so that they do not unwittingly become part of the Chinese government's campaign to violate human rights of their own citizens. This legislation is necessary, is a necessary response to one of the most pressing human rights concerns in the world today. I am glad the House is considering it, and I encourage all members to vote for its passage. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Smith. I yield such time as you may consume to the distinguished gentleman from Texas, uh, the ranking member, Mr. McCall. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise in strong support of this bipartisan Uyghur Act. I want to commend uh, my colleagues, uh, all three of you uh, from New Jersey. I think it's a New Jersey day on the floor, but uh, Mr. Smith, series, uh, you, sir, uh, Mr. Malinowski, uh, for the last several years, a communist dictatorship in Beijing has been unleashing a brutal crackdown on the Uyghur and Turkish Muslims in Western China. 
It's believed that uh, between one to three million ethnic minorities have been detained and sent to internment camps where they are indoctrinated with state propaganda and torture. The goal of the Chinese government is to strip these individuals of their religious and cultural identity. Many people detained are never heard from again. Families have been torn apart. Sons and daughters are left wondering if they will ever be reunited with their moms and dads. Some of our most senior officials, including National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, have described these detention centers as, quote, concentration camps. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has referred to China's repression as the stain of the century. The Chinese government states that these camps are part of their efforts to combat violent extremism. They also say these detention centers are job training facilities. But what is happening is nothing less than a state-sponsored and systematic campaign designed to enforce a cultural genocide. As a beacon of hope and freedom to the rest of the world, the United States cannot stay silent. If we do, our silence will be remembered as our complicity. Our inaction will become our appeasement. And we know that the Chinese Communist Party would love nothing more than for the rest of the world to mirror its authoritarianism. We cannot allow this to happen. And this legislation gives us the opportunity to take real action and help stop these evil crimes. First, it provides that the United States policy towards China should be explicitly linked to the human rights abuses. Second, it requires the application of the global magnitsky uh, sanctions on Chinese officials responsible for repression against Uyghur or Turkic, Turkish Muslims. Third, mandates the State Department submit to Congress a report on human rights abuses in this western province of China. And fifth, restricts the export of certain U.S. technology items to China that are used to suppress individual privacy, freedom of movement, and basic human rights. This is a very important bill. And again, I'd like to thank our colleagues, and particularly uh, Brad Sherman, uh, who introduced us along with Senator Rubio for all their efforts to get this done to where we are today. So let's come together as Republicans and Democrats to ensure that atrocities committed by the communist dictatorship in Beijing will have consequences. Let's show the world the United States will impose a cost on the Chinese Communist Party's leaders for their crimes now and in the future. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Gentleman from New Jersey reserves. Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sears. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I yield five minutes to the chairman of the subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, and non-proliferation, the gentleman from California, Mr. Cher Sherman. Gentleman from California is recognized. I thank the gentleman from yield for yielding. I rise to speak in favor of S-178, the Uyghur Act. This bill has the best of both worlds. It has a Senate bill number and House of Representatives content. Uh, the bill came over from the Senate, and then we unanimously adopted in the Foreign Affairs Committee my amendment in nature of a substitute, which put together three bills focused on the Uyghur issue. It included the work of Senators Marco Rubio and Robert Menendez, found in S-178 the work found in H.R. 649 of Chris Smith and Tom Swayze, uh, Swayze of this House, and uh, the legislation that I reintroduced uh, with uh, uh, the ranking member of the Asia Subcommittee, Ted Yoho, H.R. Uh, 1025. Uh, so this bill represents putting together those uh, three bills to deal with the detention of over one million Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities in Xinjiang and other Chinese repression of its Muslim minority population. The uh, Chinese government has sought to erase the distinct Uyghur Muslim culture and religious traditions through mass detentions, re-education camps, and a coordinated campaign under a banner Strike Hard Against Violent Extremism, launched in 2014. Thanks to recently leaked Chinese Communist Party documents, we now know that the impetus for this campaign came from the highest levels of the Chinese Party, 
In April 2014, General Secretary Xi ordered the party officials to, and these are the words, show absolutely no mercy in using organs of dictatorship, another quoted phrase, uh, to suppress Muslim minorities. More than a million Uyghurs were then imprisoned in camps. In a country with the rule of law, you're incarcerated by the state because you've been convicted of a defined statutory offense. Why are one million people behind barbed wire in Xinjiang province of China? The charge against them is their thinking has been infected by unhealthy thoughts. Where in the world would anyone be free if a million, if a million people can be incarcerated because the government has determined that their thoughts are unhealthy? Along with re-education camps, the Strike Hard campaign has also involved high-tech surveillance and monitoring of Uyghurs, monitoring of uh, 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 and suppressing Muslim religious practice, including funeral practices, and suppression of Uyghur language. Uh, beyond its borders, the party has tried to intimidate Chinese Muslim minorities who are living abroad. And in uh, China, some individuals with permanently permanent residency status in the United States have been prohibited from leaving the region. In Xinjiang, the party has forced Uyghur families to have Han Chinese agents live in their homes. The extent of this Chinese effort to, in effect, Sinophi, the Muslim population of Western China, is staggering. The legislation before us is an important start, but it's only a start in our efforts to counter Chinese repression of its Muslim minorities. And we will have hearings in the Asia subcommittee to develop additional steps that America could take. I want to highlight two parts of this legislation. First, the bill requires the president to impose the global Magnitsky sanctions against all Chinese officials who are responsible for the repression of the Uyghurs. We are long past the point when this should have been done, and it should not be linked to ongoing negotiations on trade or any other issue. Second, the bill requires the Commerce Department to update our export controls to ensure that the Commerce Control List, which covers dual-use items, is updated to create a, spe a special regime for China. Commerce uh, will be required to identify items that assist in the monitoring, surveillance, mass detention, and forced labor we see going on in China today, and deny licenses for the export or re-export of those items to China. U.S. technology should not be used to further one of the most egregious human rights abuses of our time. And in writing this legislation and the amendment in the nature of a substitute that came out of the Foreign Affairs Committee, we work diligently to ensure that we avoid capturing too much and unduly hindering legitimate and beneficial commerce. This included thorough discussions with the tech industry. So I thank Chairman Ingle and Ranking Member McCall, of course our speaker, uh, Nancy Pelosi, who was here, I uh, thank uh, uh, Senators Rubio and Menendez, uh, Chris Smith and Tom Swasey. I thank Jim McGovern for his work, and I thank my partner in running the Asia Subcommittee, Mr. Yoho, and I yield back. Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sears. Speaker, I reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from New Jersey, Speaker, Mr. Smith. Speaker, I yield uh, such time as you may consume to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Yoho. Gentleman, you, from of the Asia Committee. gentleman from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to give my strong support for S-178. You know, I look back over the years when we've seen this and we've had these discussions in our Foreign Affairs Committee about the, the atrocities that are going on in the Xinjiang province. You know, we, last year we talked about the concentration camps that we see going up, and then there was reports about the uh, crematoriums that were going in. And we read advertisements to hire guards for the crematorium. They must be physically fit, they must be able to defend themselves, and they know, need to know how to use a weapon. So they had armed crematoriums set up in this province. My question is, why do you need armed crematoriums if there, it's a crematorium um, to burn people, you know, the dead? And I think the intent of what China is doing is self-evident. And America is the leader of the free world in all countries that believe in freedom and liberty, 
they must stand up against this injustice because this is going on around the world. And if you believe the words of General Eisenhower at Auschwitz and other Nazi concentration camps after the end of World War II, when he said, never again, never again will we allow this to happen. But, but it's happening right now. And it's happening in an area that we know in a country that is uh, suppressing freedom around the world. We see it in Hong Kong. We've seen what they've done with Tibet. Uh, they want to do it to any country or any population that is against the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party. And this is something, if we don't do this, this will go on. And this is where the world needs to wake up. And they need to say, anytime we buy something made in China, we're empowering this, this country and Xi Jinping and the Communist Party complex to do the same thing over and over again. And it's time we make a strong stand. And S-178 is a great start to doing this. And I look for strong support in the House. I look for it to be signed in the law and that we send a strong signal uh, from America as being the leaders in the free world to the rest of the world to follow suit and send a strong signal back to China that this is not going to be tolerated. We will not put up with this. And I'd like to yield back, and I'd like to thank the sponsors of this bill um, uh, for doing what you're doing, because this is a message that America, the, the people around the world don't know what's going on. It's this body that is kind of leading the charge on this, and I'm proud to be associated with it. So thank you all. Gentleman from New Jersey Reserves. Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sears. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Swasey. Gentleman from New York is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Sears, uh, for yielding this time. I rise in strong support of the bipartisan Senate Bill 178, which holds the Chinese government accountable for their truly horrific treatment. Let me say that again, truly horrific treatment of the Uyghur Muslim minorities, including the mass internment of over one million people who are subjected to systemized brainwashing, sexual abuse, and forced labor in Western China. I want to start by thanking Chairman Engel and Subcommittee Chairman Sherman for bringing attention to this issue and supporting this legislation to penalize China for its egregious human rights violations against the Uyghurs. I'm proud to have worked with Representative Chris Smith from New Jersey and Senator Marco Rubio from Florida to help write part of this truly bipartisan legislation. Mr. Speaker, Uyghur families are prohibited from practicing their Muslim faith. They're often separated from their family members and prohibited from reading the Quran, making their daily prayers, and in some instances are forced to eat pork even during Ramadan, which of course violates their religion. The so-called re-education camps in China where Uyghurs are forced to work in food, textile, or manufacturing jobs in or near the mass internment camps are, of course, repugnant to our values and violate human rights. The brutal religious-based persecution of the Uyghurs in China is alarming, but it's not new. China has continued to repress anyone who does not conform to their system, including Tibetans, Christians, and, of course, the people of Hong Kong, as we've seen in recent events. Since President Nixon went to China in 1971, most Americans have believed that with, with increased economic integration and exposure to our system of democracy in the West, the Chinese government would someday adopt some of our fundamental values. This clearly has not happened. Not only does the Chinese government reject any real steps towards democracy, continue its unfair trade practices, and cheat by stealing our intellectual property, but it also continually violates human rights. The United States must hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable for its repression of the Uyghurs and active disregard for international law. I urge my colleagues to support the passage of this important and, again, truly bipartisan legislation, and I yield back. Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sears. Mr. Speaker, I reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from New Mr. Jersey, Mr. Speaker, I yield my such, myself such time as I may consume to close. Uh, gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, beyond what has been done to date, Chinese companies profiting from forced labor in Xinjiang must be prohibited from exporting goods to the United States and to other countries. The administration has, to its credit, blocked one Chinese company for forced labor manufacturing, but there are many other companies, particularly in the manufacturing of cotton and garments, that are profiting off the slavery of detained Uyghurs. More, many more companies need to be barred from entry into the U.S. market. 
In addition to the crimes against humanity that Xi Jinping has imposed upon the people of Xinjiang, the United States also needs to address the high-tech authoritarianism of the future being auditioned in Xinjiang. Beijing is using Xinjiang as a proving ground for an all-knowing police and surveillance state. The technology used to construct China's high-tech police state is being exported around the world to some countries in Africa, Central Asia, and beyond. Every petty dictator and aspiring totalitarian can use this technology to crush democratic aspirations, human rights, religious freedom, and the rule of law. Let me also say a word or two about Uyghur Americans. Uyghur Americans like the great Rabia Qadir, who I've been friends with since 2006, had her at hearings. She's an unbelievable leader. Her entire family, an extended family, dozens of people have been rounded up and have been put into prison. Nuri Turkel, Rushan Abbas, and Gulchera Hoja have had their families as well threatened and detained because they dared to speak up here in the United States. So many Uyghur Americans have experienced the agony of family detentions and disappearances. Again, a cruelty laid at the feet of Xi Jinping. He not only goes after the individual, he goes after the whole family. And again, the women in prisons uh, in China are sexually abused and tortured. The men are abused as well. For those watching us today, the message you hear should be clear. The United States wants to hold the Chinese government and the Chinese companies accountable for crimes against humanity and the cruelty they inflict on your families and your loved ones. We will not be silent. Justice is coming. We will de are demanding accountability. I also want to take a moment to thank the reporters of Radio Free Asia's Uyghur service. Their families have been rounded up and put into prison, into concentration camps by Xi Jinping's dictatorship. I mean, this, this is beyond horrific, and we need to respond accordingly. I also want to thank and note the contribution of Dr. Scott Flipsey to the legislation before us today, and also the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, and frankly, to the Hong Kong uh, Democracy and Human Rights Act that was signed into law just a few days ago. I also want to thank former CECE staff directors Paul Prodick and Elise Anderson, and current staff members John Stivers, Peter Mattis, Megan Fluker, and Amy Rieger for helping this Congress shine a bright light on the atrocities. And of course, our full and subcommittee staffers as well have done yeoman's work on this terrible, terrible issue. We are united today. We need to be united with all Americans uh, in saying never again. Yield back the balance of our time. Gentleman yields back. <laughs> Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sears. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume for the purpose of closing. Gentleman is recognized. It has been more than three years since the Chinese authorities have accelerated and expanded their repressive campaign in Xinjiang. The global response to these abuses up until now has been insignificant, partly due to the successful campaign Beijing has to Beijing to coerce silence from those who speak out. Where there has been talk, there has sadly been little action. Today, we have an opportunity to turn the tide by sending stro a strong message of support to the Uyghur people and, account and accountability for those Chinese officials who have violated their own people's rights and religious freedoms for years with impunity. I urge my my colleagues to join me today in sending a strong message to both the perpetrators and the victims alike with an overwhelming vote in support for this legislation. And Mr. Speaker, before I yield, I'd like to point out that there are three members of the New Jersey delegation here. Two of them are refugees from communism. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields. The question is, Will the House suspend the rules and pass Senate 178 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two thirds being in Mr. the affirmative. Mr. Speaker, I request the, the uh, yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking this vote by the, by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. 
A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20. Further proceedings on this question will be postponed. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sirez, to suspend the rules and pass S-178, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title. Senate 718, an act to condemn gross human rights violations of ethnic Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang and calling for an end to the arbitrary detention, torture, and harassment of these communities inside and outside China. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill? As amended, members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. On this vote, the yeas are 406, the nays are 1, two-thirds being the affirmative, the rules are suspended. Mr. Burchett votes aye. Okay. On this vote, the yeas are 407, the nays are 1, two thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed. Without objection, the motion to reconsider. Motion to reconsider. 